1993, the UN General Assembly declared that it aimed to eliminate violence against women and provided a framework for action on the pandemic. But it's now 2017, and one in three women still experience physical or sexual violence. Rape and sexual assault are a daily occurrence in every single country of the world. Yet the way that laws are framed in many countries dismisses this harrowing reality, leaving the perpetrators to roam freely. Sexual violence is not just violence against women and girls, but violence against society, with drastic negative effects on individuals, families and communities. It is often something which only reaches the media spotlight when extreme events occur, only to fade into oblivion shortly afterwards. Promises are easy to make. Now is the time to join efforts between government, business and civil, civil society to grasp this focus and together make meaningful change to promote equality and truly make violence against women and girls unacceptable. Please join me in welcome, welcoming tonight's panel, three incredibly inspiring women, Angela Rose, a prominent American activist and sexual assault survivor and founder of the NGO PAVE, Leslie Udwin, a British filmmaker who created the documentary India's Daughter following the brutal Delhi gang rape in 2012, and Polly Neat, CEO of Women's Aid. So I'm Polly Neat, I'm the Chief Executive of Women's Aid. We're a national organisation in the UK, so I'll be talking very much from a UK perspective. And we have around 220 local services for women, of domestic, for women uh, survivors of domestic and sexual violence. We also run a programme in schools and really importantly, um, I do quite a lot of work with government. Um, seeking to influence and sometimes successfully influencing um, government policy on violence against women and girls. So that's me. My name is Angela Rose and I'm the founder and the executive director of a nonprofit based in the United States. It's called PAVE, which stands for Promoting Awareness, Victim Empowerment, and we work across the country and globally to shatter the silence of sexual violence. I myself founded this organization out of my own experience. I was kidnapped from a shopping mall when I was 17 years old, and it turned out that the man who kidnapped me was on parole for murdering a 15-year-old girl. But when I went to report what happened to me, I wasn't believed. The detectives accused me of lying, and it was very difficult to go through this. And that's really why I founded PAVE, was to help give survivors a voice. We know overwhelmingly it's somebody that we know and we trust that commits these crimes. So we do prevention work all over the country. We're really working a lot more in high schools now. We started our work in colleges, and statistics show the best way to prevent sexual assault in college is to start that conversation younger. So we do prevention work. We engage men and women to be a part of the solution in a very positive and proactive way. We work on policy, and we also work on helping survivors thrive after trauma. So my name is Leslie Udwin, and I am in my fourth incarnation, actually. Um, I started life as a, an actor. I then became a producer of feature films. Um, and then became a director, once only, to make a very um, important and pressing uh, film called India's Daughter, about the gang rape of Jyoti Singh on a moving bus in Delhi. And as a result of that, I am now no longer a filmmaker. I'm now a human rights activist. Because what I learned on this extremely dark, but very privileged journey, making that film where I sat for 31 hours interviewing seven rapists, one of whom had raped a five-year-old girl. Uh, what I learned in terms of the insights was so searingly, blindingly clear about what needs to be done, how easy the solution to the root cause of violence against women actually is, and I'm now devoting the rest of my life to a program called Think Equal, an organization that I have founded. And um, it calls for the missing subject, social and emotional learning, 
the experiential teaching of respect, of the value of each and every person on this planet, regardless of gender, regardless of race, regardless of religion or background of any kind. Um, and it teaches this from the earliest years, from the age of three, uh, which is when children are still modifiable in terms of their attitudes and behavior. And that ends at five, that window. Um, so that is uh, my fourth incarnation. Um, now, I, I believe we are going to look at the trailer, or one of the, the trailers, a short version of it, um, of India's daughter to kick off the discussion um, about violence against women. I think that trailer quite very well sums up the issue at hand here. Um, whether it be in India or in other countries around the world, the fact remains that one in three women um, experience physical or sexual violence at some point during their lives. And everyone in this room, probably knowingly or unknowingly, knows somebody who's been a victim of sexual violence at some point during their lives. Um, so laws often focus on the breach of honour or are framed in terms of morality rather than violence. Um, so my first question to the panel would be, how do you think laws and justice systems are failing and how can they be adapted to serve justice for victims and also help prevent sexual violence from occurring in the future? Do you want me to start? I mean, I, I can only talk about the justice system here. Um, and I think it's not so much a matter of laws being framed in terms of honour and morality, but actually the way women experience the criminal justice system is still framed in terms of moral judgment on them. Mm. Very recently, um, there a lot of commentators um, have said about a particularly high profile case, the Ched Evans case. They've said no one comes out of this with any credit. And they're saying that because she was drunk. Well, you know, <laughs> it's pretty unbelievable. That is a, an absolute moral judgment against her that implies that whatever happened to her is fine because she was drunk. It actually comes from the same place as that guy saying, you know, if you leave your diamond out on the street, someone mm. will nick it. It comes from that place of looking at a woman as worth less than a man and a woman's activities as being something that can be judged in a very different way from those of a man. And we still have that in our legal system. You know, it's actually only since the um, 1990s that rape within marriage was made a crime seems pretty unbelievable, but actually the vast majority of sexual offences in this country are committed by a current or former intimate partner. And the huge majority of them aren't reported. And we work with women all around the country. And the last thing they will ever tell anyone about in terms of the violence they've experienced from a partner is the sexual violence. And actually, I know women who haven't spoken about it um, for decades. And that's because they don't want their children to know you know, they don't want anybody to know that that's what they've experienced because it does bring a stigma. It brings something, there's something about what did you do to make that happen to you? And talking about the law, the law isn't only about the criminal justice system. I'll stop in a second. It's also about, um, so this government is introducing a policy where if you have more than two children, you can't get any child tax credit unless your child's conceived as a result of rape and you say that your child was conceived as a result of rape, then you can get the tax credit. That's part of our legal system in this country that is being introduced right now, that is making women disclose something that is highly stigmatised, that inevitably their child is highly likely to find out about in order to get um, a benefit without which um, many women won't be able to um, pay their rent, for example, because we all know about, um, well, you may not actually, but we all, there's a huge reform to the benefits system going on and rents are becoming completely unaffordable. So we're still living, even in this country, in a legal system that has echoes, albeit of, you know, that is really, really extreme. But I don't think we should be complacent and be pointing fingers at other cultures. Um, you've made such, such incredibly persuasive points. I don't want to address the, 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 you know, the same ones in any way, um, but I, I do want to just um, mention one uh, statistic about a country that is a so-called progressive, enlightened country, which has 
that very rare thing, a prime minister who is a man and calls himself a feminist. Canada. What are the rape reporting statistics in Canada? 3%. 3% of rapes in Canada are reported. Why? Because those women are taken through the courts, the women who are the survivors of rape or well, the survivors, because if they were victims, they wouldn't be alive. But um, they are taken through the courts with the onus on them to prove. And they are given such a rough ride by judges and prosecution lawyers in Canada that a country as enlightened as that has probably the worst, one of the worst records of, of rape reporting statistics in the world. And of that 3% that's reported, 1.5%, so 50% of that figure reported, 1.5% of all rapes are prosecuted. And of that now diminished 1.5% of all rapes, half again are convicted. So a man in Canada can rape with 99.25% impunity, knowing he will just not be brought to justice. What good is the law? The law is utterly inadequate. Now, it has its place and it has some, of course, some benefits. Um, I think it's interesting to talk also about the law leading to and focusing on quantum of punishment. We've just had the death sentences of the four surviving adult rapists in the Jyoti Singh gang rape um, upheld by the Supreme Court a judgment that we've waited for for two years on a so-called fast-track case. Um, and it's going to mean nothing, this death penalty. It's going to take us nowhere. In fact, if anything, I think it's going to mean greater dangers for rape uh, victims because it will lead to men killing their victims so that they cannot identify them. A dead raped girl cannot identify you, right? And Mukesh tells us that in the film, and he knows what he's talking about because he's doing the raping. So we should listen to him. And then just the final point I want to make is, you know, India has some amazing laws. India is far more enlightened and sophisticated in having Article 14 of its constitution, which gives equality to women under the law. The USA does not have that. The USA has still not ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. Why? Just give them, on paper, equality. They won't do that. They've resisted that since the 50s, right? But in India, the law may be enlightened, but culture overrules law. So in the face of culture and socio-cultural thinking, which tells you that the girl, from the day you first draw breath in the world, the girl is of lesser or no value when compared to you, what does it matter if you have enlightened laws? Absolutely. Well, I just want to begin by thanking all of you so much for being here tonight. Thank you to the Oxford Union for bringing this panel that has never been done. This is an unprecedented event here at the Oxford Union, and we're so grateful for all of you to be out here. I want to say just a couple of things about the, the policy piece. We see in the United States and all over the world that so many survivors are oftentimes very re-traumatized and re-victimized when they go through the system. So just as some of my other panelists mentioned underreported, I can speak from the United States that nine out of 10 women in college who are raped, they don't report the crime. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And we can see so many of the issues where rape survivors are still sometimes having to pay for their own rape exams, the sexual assault nurse examiners. There are so many things that are happening that of course so many survivors are even more silenced because of fear and because of shame. I think that shame is such a huge piece of it and so often policy in the criminal justice system just crystallizes this notion of shame so profoundly and it keeps survivors silent. I'll also mention that I was a part of the White House task force to protect students from sexual assault chaired by Vice President Biden and one of the pieces that I'm so passionate about is yes this affects so many women but there's also a lot of marginalized populations that we have to be aware of and the policy needs to look at that as well. A lot of male survivors, a lot of survivors in the LGBT community and so often these folks oftentimes don't have the resources so I think the policy piece is very important and bringing survivors' voices to the table is so critical. 
I worked with Congresswoman Custer, who founded the bipartisan task force to end sexual violence in Congress. And it was so inspirational because she is, you know, obviously you all have seen the news. It's a very divisive time in our nation's history in the States. And the one thing that I feel very passionately about that hopefully people can come together on both sides of the equation is safe communities, safe families, and safe schools. May I just amplify the, the point you made about, you know, this interesting thing of, in certain cultures, there is dishonor and shame that adhere to the survivor of, for example, a rape or an abuse. So, so there it's easy to understand why they are so reluctant to come forward, because the entire weight of society, um, you know, leads to that silence. I was raped when I was 18. I was raped and lived at the time in South Africa, a country where there is no such dishonor or sense of shame adhering. And I kept this silent for 20 years. And the reason was that I was so sure, first of all, I was sure he was going to murder me, and he didn't, so I kind of felt such a relief at having got off just being raped and not murdered, that that sense of relief kind of made me think, you're, you're lucky, you're lucky to have got away with your life. And then I felt that if I told even my best friend, I would be judged for having had bad judgment. Why did you trust him? I went to his home because he said he was having a party. And when I arrived, there was no one there. Why didn't I turn on my heels? You know, human instinct is to regret any um, misfortune that befalls you. If you go to the shop and fall on the way and break your ankle, you think, what's wrong with me? Why did I have to go to the shop then? I could have waited till seven o'clock tonight when, you know, it's our, it's our natural instinct to regret these things. So everything is geared to keeping us silent. Um, but of course, the thing that is mostly oppressive in this is patriarchy. Patriarchy is responsible for all of this. Until we change the mindset, we'll change nothing. I think that those responses actually lead us very well onto my next question, which, so um, it's often said that unless governments fix their laws on rape and sexual assault and implement them effectively and sensitively, as we've touched upon, we are unlikely to see an end to the worldwide abuse of women and girls. Um, but my question is that, do you believe that this will, the change of laws will solve the problem? Or do you think that there's a deeper cultural problem at hand? And how do you think we can go about tackling that cultural problem? I think you need, you, you do need um, the proper legal framework. So I, w I think important, I'm just about to say how incredibly important culture is, but I don't want to be saying that we don't need laws that are capable of protecting victims, because we do. Um, but I think there's a huge cultural piece. Um, and yeah, it is patriarchy. Uh, what it's about is um, a, a sense of entitlement and privilege that half of the population have bred into them and the other half don't. And I'm not talking about people who go to Oxford and the rest of the world, I'm talking about men and women. And I think that's, um, you know, we just have to kind of get over this kind of, oh my God, that sounds a bit feminist and actually just deal with it, you know. And I think we need to have a more sophisticated debate and actually challenge the culture. So we get really het up on this thing about you know, boys don't understand consent. Well, they don't. But how kind of bloody weird is that? I mean, surely consent is when I tick a box on a form saying, yes, I don't mind receiving marketing materials from your company. If you're going to have sex with somebody, you want them to actually actively want to. And until that is kind of really understood and how we talk about things in a kind of intelligent and more sophisticated way, we're never going to have a culture that does anything about it. And I know what peer pressure is like, you know, I wasn't always this age, and it is really, really difficult to stand up to things. But what I would say is, you know, if there's a student night on, and it's called golf pros and golf hoes, hit patriarchy where it hurts. That's the wallet. Don't go. You don't have to go. And if you don't go, somebody will think, why has no one turned up to our fantastic golf hoes and golf pros night? Oh, maybe it's because it's a load of sexist crap, which it is, yeah? So, 
<laughs> there's kind of, there are things, I don't want people to feel kind of disempowered that we can't do anything about it, because actually we can, it just takes, uh, just doing something like that and actually saying to somebody else, I'm not going to go because that's sexist, is really, really bloody hard, I know that, it is really hard, especially for boys, but it's really hard for everyone actually, so I would just really beg you, just do something little just to stand up against this culture because it does start to have an effect and it is really important because that is the, the backdrop in which then um, violence against women is trivialised and condoned. Things like that do matter. Little steps like that actually do really matter and make a difference. If there's a club when, you know, if you're a guy and you go, oh, women always moan about all this sexism, but I don't get free drinks. Why do girls get free drinks? They get free drinks to lure blokes to the club. That's why, yeah? It's to make money, that's why. So don't complain about it, challenge it. Because actually, there are people making money all the time out of sexism in our society. There's a lot of money to be made out of that. And we, there is something we can do about that. It's not gonna solve the problem, but it's something that we can all feel empowered to do. Obviously, there's work needs to be done in schools, so we've spent, um, I've spent four years trying to argue through with members of the Cabinet to make um, sex and relationships education compulsory in schools, and we've just done it. The government is making now, in this country, um, education about healthy relationships compulsory. Brilliant, that's a really, really significant step forward. So there are bigger things that politicians can do and things that people like me are employed to do and we just have to keep on trying till we do it. But there are things everybody can do. I think the language piece is really powerful. Like she mentioned, the power of language to really change the culture. We work in a lot of high schools, and one thing that I found to be so critical is the way that we message these things. If you make something positive and proactive, like making the consent culture cool, we have a consent is campaign where people write what consent means to them on these wristbands, gender neutral, and we have high school students set up these tables. So we had the entire soccer team at one of the schools that we work with, and these young men what it did is they talked about how it changed their culture at their school, where they started to call each other out if there was some inappropriate or disrespectful things being said about women. And it was amazing to see that I do feel like we do have the power to change our culture, but the policy piece absolutely needs to be included, and that's another thing is that education. I think it needs to start so much younger. So thank you for that work. That's incredible. Um, I think that there are, there are two... Um, Di very distinct arenas, and, and law and legal frameworks address the fallout arena. Now, of course, we have to deal with fallout because this is a pernicious and ubiquitous problem that uh, pervades every single country in the world. Of course, we have to deal with the fallout. But what in God's name are we doing about prevention? Prevention, the law can have absolutely no effect on. The only way to tackle the root cause, to tackle prevention, is through education, which is the primary engine of progress and which is the only way you can change mindset. You can't legislate for mindset change, but you can educate into a different mindset. Mandela said that education is the most powerful weapon we have to change the world with. And I, as a result of this film we saw the trailer of, uh, found myself wondering what he meant by education, because as you saw, those lawyers, um, and, and the film is, is full of much worse statements by the lawyers, far more entrenched in their misogyny and devaluation of women than the rapists themselves. Far more. That's what shocks most about this film, that these lawyers who have had the highest access to education, highest degree of access possible with their LLBs and their, are worse. One of the lawyers actually said, if my daughter behaved like that, and he meant went to see a movie at a mall, Life of Pi, a 6.30 screening, which meant she would have to go home when it was dark, 
and was with a boy who was neither her husband nor her brother. That's what he meant by, if my daughter behaved like that. I would take her to my farmhouse, and in front of my whole family, I would pour petrol on her and burn her alive, said a lawyer. So at that point, I understood that, of course, the education Mandela was talking about was not access to education, nor surely was it the kind of education that we have been so obsessed with hitherto, uh, a system which was designed in and for the Industrial Revolution in 1820 and has not been revised since, of numeracy and literacy and testing, full stop, a system of education that pro you know, provides skills for the job market, but does not provide the basic life skill education that enables a child to, to know how to be empathetic, how to solve conflicts peacefully, how to be emotionally intelligent and self-regulate and respect each and every human being, regardless of, of their gender and break down gender stereotypes. We've been leaving that to the parents. And that is the most irresponsible thing we've done because the parents increasingly don't have time to educate children with value-based education and nor are they capable of it because they themselves are stuck in the mire of discriminatory mindset, which is the basis of all violence. So until and unless we start with the three to five-year-olds when neuroscientists have told us loud and clear for decades, only we're not listening and we're sleeping through all this, and we'd rather deal with the fallout and spend billions, trillions on incarceration of perpetrators and medical bills for the victims, you know, instead of spending a pittance and educating children to love and not hate, which is another Mandela quote, no child is born hating anyone on the basis of his background, religion or, or race. A child has to learn to hate. And if he can learn to hate, he can be taught to love. Um, so I guess my final question actually, before we open things up to the floor, um, is that the amount of media attention given to fraudulent or false reports of sexual violence, such as the Duke University fraternity rape case, is disproportionate to the amount of coverage given to incidents in which reports of actual rapes were ignored by authorities. And do, so my question to the panel is, do you think that the way the media covers sexual violence perpetrates rape culture? And how can the role that media and journalists play at, um, adapt so, and change in the way that they cover these stories? Um, yes, the way the media covers it obviously exacerbates the issue, definitely. Um, and I think there's kind of two things. There's a, a kind of just um, knee-jerk reaction, kind of perpetuation of myths about women making it up and women... I've, I've already talked about, you know, women being drunk and all of this kind of thing. Um, and then there's the, the kind of so-called more sophisticated media type debate that I think is, is really woefully inadequate and still isn't really talking about the cultural reasons why, why sexual violence is so ingrained in our culture. But I don't think it's... I actually don't think the problem is the news media because I think education can enable you to look more critically at news media. And yes, I'm, I'm sure education changes behaviour, but the thing to me is the... Um, absolute kind of ubiquity of inequality within just popular culture just completely generally so everywhere you walk down the street you see billboards where women are portrayed as sexualized objectified you know objects of lust and men are portrayed as powerful every i don't watch a lot of music videos now because i'm really old but the only time i do is when i go and get my nails done and I sit there, having my nails done, and watch, literally going, it takes about 45 minutes to have a shellac, and as I'm doing it, mm. as I'm doing it, I'm seeing a parade of fully clothed, really gesticulating, aggressively, blokes, surrounded by gyrating, twerking, gorgeous, you know, semi-naked women, one after the other, going past. And that's the culture, that's kind of the media that is getting into our heads and making us behave in certain ways and making us see each other in certain ways. And just nowhere near portraying 
men, or, men and women as being equal. And until we are able to say no to some of that or give our young people the critical um, faculties to deal with that, so the answer to that isn't to say ban it, you know, the answer to the fact that boys look at porn on their smartphones isn't to try and, you know, make it ever more difficult for that to happen. It's to give our young people the kind of critical faculties to understand what they're seeing and be able to put it in some sort of context and understand, you know, that that isn't actually, um, porn isn't what normal sex ought to be like, for example. Um, so I think, yes, it's the media, but I think much more powerful than kind of the news media or the official media is just the much wider culture. And that's the things that I was trying to say before. We can all, in our own way, start to do something about. We can question it and we can start to kind of say no to it a bit more. It's difficult, but it can be done. Um, something interesting happened uh, in India, which is in fact what took me to India to make this film in the first place. Uh, and that was that the media ensured that the protests which erupted um, initially by the students, the Jawaharlal Nehru University uh, was, was kind of on the first day of protests after the gang rape, uh, they, the students came out. And then the media and protesters worked together and the flames of this protest were fanned to the most stunning, beautiful, admirable degree. Um, it went on for over a month and there were hundreds of thousands of, of enlightened and, and wonderful men and women out on those streets and that is what actually made me go out to India. The irony is the film was then banned and I was accused of bringing, you know, a, a conspiracy of bringing shame on India um, because of course they, they did not want to look in the mirror. Um, but in fact, I went there because this was the first time I'd seen any country in the whole world stand up and demand with its media um, uh, a screaming in, in, in perfect harmony with the protesters uh, that enough was enough and we're not having our women disrespected like this anymore. Um, so the media can actually sometimes play a hugely positive role. But, 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 I'm sorry, I am, I am think equal AC, uh, OCD now, okay, because for a year and a half now I have been fighting to bring this new uh, program into life um, and so I can think of nothing else. Uh, for me, nothing else exists because it's a mountain to climb this. It's global. It's every country in the world who's heads of state and, and ministers of education, we are persuading to mandate compulsorily this missing subject. So I cannot but bring everything back down to it, uh, which is this, that amazing campaign with media behaving in the most exemplary way, meaningless, it's all over. You know, it disappeared within two months. Look at what the media are doing there now. Look at the government in India now, which is the most repressive, undemocratic, hideous government imaginable. It's a tragedy. Um, you know, in, in, the, in the world's so-called greatest democracy, absolutely heartbreaking. So that, all of that is ephemeral. But in Sri Lanka, which is the country whose prime minister has committed to being the first think equal country in the world, where 35,000 schools next year from January are rolling out to every three, four and five year old in that country compulsorily, the 140 lesson plans that we have had designed by social and emotional learning experts in the world, a committee of 20. In Sri Lanka, in one generation's time, I guarantee you, we won't have a media problem. We won't have a law problem because we'll have an enlightened new generation who do not judge women to be of lesser or no value as compared with men. I agree with my panelists wholeheartedly. A couple of things that I do want to add though is that when you look at the way that journalists and the media talk about sexual assault survivors as the accuser, for example, are you ever going to hear that with a mugging, for example? No, but sexual assault and sexual violence comes with a different type of stigma that's attached to it that we all have to be mindful of. And 
you would be amazed if you really start to have a watchful eye when you're reading articles or when you're watching television shows and the news about these things. Really, really think about the way that these these survivors are being talked about. I'll share with you just one quick story. There was a big news story about a 17-year-old young lady named Chessie Prout. She was a survivor of the St. Paul School's sexual assault case. There was senior boys that committed these slings, uh, basically sexual assaults of freshman girls. And so she went to court, went to trial, very difficult to go through the process. He was convicted. Well, he was fighting for a new trial, and so they started to refer to her as the accuser yet again, even though the perpetrator was convicted. She is no longer the accuser, she is a survivor, and so it's very re-traumatizing in the language that journalists use. One other thing that I wanna talk about too is, especially for childhood sexual abuse, the sexualized tone that people take. If you read some of these you know, articles about childhood sexual abuse using the word panties for a five-year-old, no, five-year-olds don't have panties, they have underwear. Right? Like little, little things like that, nuances, can make such a difference. And so that's all I wanted to say is the power of language. Yeah, absolutely. And we still routinely hear, have news reports referring to child porn, for example. There is no such thing as child porn. Yeah. You know. Um, those are images of child sexual abuse. And you shouldn't be using that terminology. Journalists shouldn't. Yeah. And th there's lots and lots of examples of that. You're so right, yeah. Um, so I think now might be a good time to open it up to the floor. So if anyone has a question, if you'd like to put your hand in the air. Um, yeah, at the front. Hey, um, uh, my name is Jawad, and I'm a master's student studying policy here. Uh, thank you very much for uh, such an informative session. I really enjoyed it and I learned so much from this. Uh, so my ma major question is like, while you're fighting the sexual violence and what's the major or the bigger hindrance? Is it the policies in the countries or is it the lo lack of law in the land? And when you say ed about like changing the curriculum, is any government or any country around the world, they are actually putting uh, consent or sexual consent in their curriculum in education? Thank you. So it's mindset change. You see, I believe that what underlies the act of violence, the violence, the rape, the abuse, isn't the disease. That's the symptom of the disease. What is the disease? The disease is a mindset that discriminates, a mindset that says she should not be doing that. She is of less value. Let me be very specific. Gorov, who raped the five-year-old, who I sat with for three hours, and he told me everything about what he had done to this little girl. And at the end of this interview, I said, Gorov, help me, please help me. Because I can go imaginatively in your head up to the point where you're standing there and you're looking at her and you've now shown me how tall she was. I made him stand up from his chair and show me. It was the most chilling moment I've ever experienced as he put his hand to his knee and with a sort of nervous half smile showed me how tall she was. She got up to his knees, right? And I said, so now I'm looking at this child and I can see, because you've described her so well, what you were seeing. Now help me understand. How do you then go that next and final step. How do you convert an intention into action when you're looking at this tiny, frail little creature? And he looks at me like I'm insane. It's the stupidest question he's ever heard in his life. And he goes, she was a beggar girl. Her life was of no value, quote unquote. What is that? That is mindset. It's mindset of discrimination. She's a beggar girl. It's a double whammy. She's a girl, she's of no value. She's a beggar girl, she's of absolutely no value. You can crush her like a cockroach, but, right? Yes, but in this country, when a man um, has sex with a woman, rapes a woman who's too drunk to know what's going on, that's ex that is the same it's mindset. Identical. It's identical. That's identical. the same mindset because no what he's, he's saying that she isn't sufficiently valuable to him as a human being for her participation in the sex act to have any meaning whatsoever. It's, That's right. it's immaterial to him whether she's enjoying it or wants it or, or not. Conscious she, or not. She, you know, and, and that is the same mindset about a sense of entitlement mm -hmm. 
to women's bodies. And that is fed by our culture. It can be challenged through education, but I think it's going to be a longer process than one generation, I've got to say. And that in but, terms but of... education, what kind of... You see, we use this word really loosely. Yeah. I don't mean the education as we know it. It's never been tried yet on this earth. How can we say, no, we are not going to try... I'm not saying that at all. No, no, so, but I mean, it's a resistance, isn't it? There is a resistance yeah. to believing that it can be done in one generation. Of course it can be done in one generation. It's easy, actually. If you inculcate values into every three and four-year-old and five-year-old who go to school, even if you don't reach the others who don't, you have brought an entire generation into equal thinking. Of course that's going to make every difference in your society because those people who sense the entitlement won't be sensing it. Well, yeah, I, th I think it's worth doing and we have a, a programme called Expect Respect at Women's Aid where we have a lesson plan for every school year from pre-nursery uh, age, so age three, right up until age 18. And it teaches concepts like consent, but it teaches them in an absolutely age-relevant way. So you don't teach a three-year-old about sexual consent, obviously, but you teach them about their boundaries and about what does it mean when you, somebody doesn't want something and how do you tell if somebody wants something, all of that. So there's a whole lesson plan. The government are going to make, um, in this country, sex and relationships education compulsory. There's going to be a lot of um, discussion still about what that's actually going to involve. I guess... I'm not at all saying that isn't important. It is really, really, really important. But unless we also challenge the cultural environment within which those young people are living, um, I think it, you need, it, it needs to be backed up by um, a real conscious effort to challenge those cultural factors that have just as much influence on young people once you get to um you know your teens you're influenced by school yes you're massively influenced by your peers and to some extent school can influence your peers and can provide an environment to debate things in a different way with your peers you're influenced by your parents well millions of children um, three quarters of a million children in this country every year are witnessing domestic violence so um, for a lot of children, the influence uh, uh, of home is deeply problematic. And then you're very, very much influenced by the culture and the peer pressure and what the kind of society you live in is pressurising you to do. And so, you know, it's not an easy answer. It's not, it's not straightforward. But I think education is, is critical. But I think those other things are really important as well. And if we don't look at the whole piece, and I guess that's why I'm saying, you know, that the, the, the government can make... Um, sex and relationship education compulsory, they have done. People can provide lesson plans, that's brilliant, they have done that. You know, there's, there's lots of things that can happen at a policy level, but challenging that culture is up to you and me and all of us. Let me just, can I jump in here for just a quick minute? One thing that we found is even when the consent in different programs are mandatory, if they're presented by a teacher, sometimes it can be very awkward. So what we did is we found the power in peer education. So we go in with our paid facilitators, but we train students, for example, in high schools, on colleges, you know, we train students to be able to deliver that message with us because we found that that makes such a difference, especially with the, the notion of consent. A lot of people don't even understand what that means. It has to be enthusiastic. It has to be verbal and consistent. And, and mutual and ongoing and all these things and, and at the base of it it's so it would be more enjoyable for both so it has to be kind of positive tone I think instead of I think people want to be more for something than they are against something does that make sense and so I feel like you know the education piece absolutely but leaders set the tone and if you look at for example in the United States sports huge for us the NFL how often perpetrators of sexual violence and domestic violence are given a slap on the wrist and still able to play. Then you look at like the state of Indiana, for example, where they are making it completely, they, they're banning any type of violent offender from playing sports. And so we do need to step up and that has to come from a multiple pronged, multidisciplinary approach. Oftentimes people work in very siloed areas, but we all have to work together. I just have to say again, it is changing culture that we're talking about. It is absolutely that kind of, and I have to find a different word to education because every time I say education, you know, you think about the education that as it exists. I am talking about something that does not exist. 
that has not existed yet. And I'm not talking about a glittering uh, lesson plan here or there, or I am talking about, let's take maths out of the curriculum completely. What would happen? How would people react if we said, maths doesn't have to be compulsory, just pull it out? Yeah, I mean, I agree with this. So, you know, and that is exactly what, it's culture change. Mindset change is culture change. But the culture is the same as you've pointed out in the UK as it is in Yemen or India or Saudi Arabia. It's just to different degrees and in different, you know, with different characteristics. But that culture change is what needs to change from the earliest years. Sex and, and reproductive health education at the age of 12, far too late and meaningless, actually. Because it's all about values and humanity. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so I think that unfortunately that's going to be all that we've got time for this oh, evening. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was a great question. <laughs> I'm sure there are more people who've got questions. So um, if you'd like to join some of the panelists in the bar, I'm sure they'd be um, more than happy to answer those questions for you there. Um, but if we'd like to just take a moment to thank the panelists this evening, it's been really incredible. Thank you.